Howdy. Today we're going to keep talking about defects in materials, and we're shifting on to think about linear defects. Uh, and so there are going to be a couple videos here, but first we're going to talk about uh, the general Volterra construct, uh, and that's basically um, a way to visualize and relate all these different kind of linear defects. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the two main classes of linear defects. Um, so those are dislocations and disclinations. Uh, what are they? What do they mean? And what terms do we use to describe those? So in this video, we're really going to focus just on dislocations, and we'll tackle disclinations in the next video. Um, so again, just as a reminder, real materials are flawed things, just like you and me, and these imperfections control a lot of their properties. Um, we talked previously about point defects, things like vacancies, interstitials, um, and now we're, we're talking about linear defects. And so it's important to remember, all of these are things where um, the defect itself is an extended one-dimensional line. It could curve, uh, it could point in different directions, but it's a line. Um, and so when we talk about dislocations and disclinations, make sure you're visualizing them um, as a line. So the Volterra construct was actually developed a long time before we even thought about crystal lattices um, and atomic scale defects. Um, and it was basically developed to think about elastic solids uh, and what kind of stress uh, was exhibited in an elastic uh, material if we uh, had introduced um, some kind of an imperfection in that. And so the basic idea is that we think about something um, that is like a, a cylinder um, and pretend it's a sort of a rubbery, stretchy cylinder. Um, and we make a slice. And so in this case, uh, A is illustrating our perfect cylinder. Um, B is after we have made a slice. Uh, and so this gray surface here uh, is the surface that we've cut. Uh, and then we displaced one side relative to the other. And so this, uh, the back side, uh, is shifted up, or alternatively, the front side is shifted down. Uh, and then we picture healing the material um, back. Um, and so we no longer have a surface that is a cut. It's, it's been fused back into each other. And so again, you can think about treating rubbers this way, but we can ultimately apply this um, uh, conceptual line of thought to crystal lattices. Um, and the important thing is that in the original material, you know, if I draw a line all the way around here, um, this circuit connects and closes on itself. Um, whereas after I've gone through this process, after I've introduced a cut and displaced one side relative to each other, if I make that same circuit, it doesn't connect anymore. And that means that there's some residual um, elastic stress and strain in the system um, and that displacement is what we're going to talk about when we talk about dislocations, because that's going to ultimately become the Burgers vector. Um, so again, there's, there, there are a couple different ways to visualize this. This is just a different um, set of images, um, but it's, it's this same um, elastic rubbery washer. So picture something that's like a rubbery washer. And again, we made a slice. Um, and this is really showing us that we can do a couple things with that slice. And these are all examples of translating one side relative to the other. Um, and so again, after I made the cut in uh, this top case, um, one side is translated in this direction relative to the other. So there's, there's a gap that is opened up. Um, in the second image B, uh, one side is translated in this direction uh, relative to the other. Um, and in, in C, again, that translation direction uh, is pointing a different way. But in all of these cases, um, if I take that cut, I ask how does one side of the surface, let's call this number one, move with respect to number two. And these are all cases where I translate it, and the result of translating and then refusing the solid back together is a dislocation. Um, so again, a dislocation is a linear access uh, 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 sorry, a linear defect, and it's occurring um, in all these cases um, along this vertical axis. Um, so dislocations are observed in all crystalline solids. Um, they're observed quite a bit more in metals, and so things that deform plastically they're especially important in. Uh, 
um, but they are definitely observed in crystalline solids. So translating is not the only kind of displacement that I could envision. So let's go through that same process. You know, I have that uh, this perfect washer, um, and again, I made a cut. Um, and instead of translating one side with respect to the other, what happens if I rotate one side? And so these are three different cases where the axis of rotation is oriented differently in each case. So this dashed line here is the axis of rotation. And so in this case, I'm opening up a wedge. In this case, the axis of rotation is perpendicular to this Z axis. Um, and so uh, the, the gap, the angle that's opened up is uh, again around this uh, axis of rotation here. Um, and in a third case, that axis of rotation is again perpendicular to the z-axis, um, but in a different orientation. And so um, these result in what are called disclinations. Um, and again, there are different kinds of dis disclinations. There are wedge and twist disclinations, just like there are different kind of dislocations. Um, but the important thing here is that disclinations result when I have uh, rotated one side with respect to the other, whereas dislocations result when I have translated one side with respect to the other. Um, disclinations are especially common in liquid crystals. It turns out they have a very high energy um, to occur in uh, a lot of crystal lattices, and so they don't um, occur as commonly in those cases, um, but they're very important for liquid crystal systems. Um, so that was a uh, Volterra construct on a sort of larger macroscopic scale where we're thinking about this as sort of a rubbery solid that we're displacing. Um, and it can very easily be translated down to an atomic scale. Um, and, and again, some of these pictures are going to look very similar to what we just uh, saw, but we're going to walk through them again. Um, and in this case, let's picture starting with a perfect crystal uh, and making a slice. And so, you know, it's pretty hard to make a slice in a perfect crystal. Um, so I brought a special tool. This is our crystal lightsaber here. Um, and it allows us to make a perfect slice into that crystal. And so that's what this red box is. That's the plane that we have um, created a slice upon. Um, and again, we're going to move one side of that crystal lattice with respect to the other. And so, so again, this is a translation. And in this case, um, I moved the top part up with respect to the bottom part. And, and now I'm showing these green lines. And so these green lines, in this case, we're thinking about things at the atomic scale. And so those are, uh, those are suggesting um, atomic planes. And so what we see is on the top part, those atomic planes, you know, um, they've been shifted a little bit, but they're continuous over here. Um, in this other case, in this central line here, that atomic plane basically gets split and bifurcates. And so to complete this Voltaire construction, the next step is basically backfilling this gap with any missing atoms. And so, you know, when we make the cut, when we separate it out, um, there's some small vacuum gap. So let's go ahead and, and fill that gap back in with atoms. Um, and that result is basically an extra half plane of atoms. And so I'm going to talk about this. I'm going to use this phrase quite a bit, this extra half plane, um, because um, we can kind of see it here. Uh, when, we, when we backfill that um, slice back in, what we're doing is we're basically putting in a, a plane of atoms, but it only extends this far. Um, and, and this line is that important line that we're talking about. This line is the dislocation, and the line itself is the defect, not this half a plane of atoms. So the dislocation is the boundary of the extra half a plane. Um, and so that's really important, because if I kind of picture uh, looking at the crystal over here in this aqua box, it looks perfect. It doesn't look perturbed at all. And similarly, if I look over here, and, and keep in mind that extra half a plane passes through this aqua box, but I can't see any defect within this box. Um, the defect is contained entirely within this yellow circle. So the defect, again, is that line, and there's some distortion that's localized to around that line. Um, but if I look to the right, to the left, above, below, far enough away from that circle, then the crystal looks perfect. 
And again, that's really just pointing out that the defect is a line and that, you know, that area um, that's immediately around that line because that's where the, the residual strain is um, uh, localized. So when we're talking about dislocations, uh, the biggest um, thing that we need to understand is the concept of Berger's vectors. Um, and so again, Berger's vectors um, are, are the vector that describes uh, the dislocation. So it differentiates an edge from a screw dislocation. And it also tells us something about the magnitude of the dislocation. So the magnitude of the Berger's vector is important in this case. And it's especially important when I start needing to think about how different dislocations interact with each other. Um, so again, you probably have seen this concept built out before, but let's work through it again. The, the idea of a Berger's vector is if, if we define a circuit around a perfect crystal um, where I move right some number of lattice steps, so one, two, three, I move down some number of lattice steps. And so in this case, again, we're going to go down three. And then if I go back, so I move to the left and equal an opposite number of steps as I move to the right. So I, I move three to the right, so I got to move three back. And if I went three down, I should go three up. In this case, if the crystal is a perfect crystal, as long as the, the distance that I move to the right equals the distance I move to the left, and same with the vertical up and down distance, then that circuit should close on itself. It should make a loop. Now, if I do this same approach and the circuit is around a dislocation, and so again, this is the symbol for an edge dislocation, but the dislocation itself is a, a line that's extending in and out of the plane of the board. Um, and if I complete that loop around that dislocation, then it no longer closes. Um, and so in this case, we're going to start here. Uh, we're going to shift one, two, three, four steps over. So I go plus four, four to the right. I go down, in this case, I'm going down five, minus five. And then I go, I have to go four steps to the left and five steps up. That would have closed if it was a perfect crystal, but it's not. There's a dislocation in the middle of this circuit. And when I do that, uh, my finish, my end point is not coincident with my starting point anymore. And so the Berger's vector is the vector that connects the two ends of that circuit. Um, so, uh, yeah, in this case, I've gone to the right, I've gone down, I've gone to the left, I've gone up, but because there's a dislocation there, um, they don't end, and so that Berger's uh, circuit is important. So we do need to talk about convention. Um, so one of the most common conventions is right-hand start-to-finish convention. And we need to talk about the convention because the convention is the thing that relates the sign of the Berger's vector to the sign of the uh, dislocation. Um, so again, remember, a dislocation is a line, but we can describe it with a vector, and a vector has a direction and a magnitude. Um, and so the direction in this case, uh, that vector has an x, and that means it's a vector that's pointing into the board. And so, you know, just like with other cases where you've applied the right-hand rule, you, um, you direct your hand so your thumb is pointing in the direction of this vector, and your fingers are curling, and they'll tell you which direction we want to, um, we want to work our way around. So if my thumb goes into the board with my right hand, this only <laughs> works if you use your right hand, then my fingers are curling in a clockwise direction. And so I pick a starting point, um, and because I have, again, because I've defined this dislocation to go into the board, um, I need to move around um, that dislocation in a clockwise direction. And so that's why I start off going to the right, and then I go down, and then to the left, and then I go up. Um, and the second part of this convention tells us how we connect that Berger's vector at the end. So right hand start to finish, SF means start to finish. So that means the Berger's vector um, uh, has its uh, uh, begins at the starting point uh, and it's pointing to the finish point. Um, so again, in the case where I have the edge dislocation, I've defined it to go into the board. This Berger's vector is a vector that is one unit cell uh, long and it's pointing from right to the left in this case. So what changes if I look at that same exact 
um, case, but I've decided to define my burgers vector um, with an opposite sign. So I, I'm sorry, I've, if I've decided to define my dislocation vector with an opposite sign. Because remember, the dislocation is a line. And ultimately, I have to choose how to define that line. Um, and I could, you know, I could equally validly have that um, a dislocation vector be pointing into the board or pointing out of the board. Um, but uh, when I switch the direction, so now I have um, the lattice seems the same, but the vector is pointing out. So if I try and apply my right hand rule, um, what's going to happen is that now I need to start here and curl around counterclockwise. And because uh, my burgers vector goes from the start to the finish, and this is my finish point now, the sign of the burgers vector has now been reversed. So ultimately, if I, if I define um, the direction of the vector along the edge dislocation, that's going to fix the direct in, direction of the burgers vector. And this is really important because we're not going to we're not going to necessarily get into it now. But um, what you need to know is that when dislocations um, interact, they can basically add up uh, or they can annihilate each other. And so if you picture um, two edge dislocations coming together and they're equal in magnitude but have an opposite sign, those two edge dislocations can cancel each other out and they can annihilate each other. Um, and that would be the case if the burgers vector is different um, sign in the two cases. Um, the path that I choose to follow is arbitrary. So there's absolutely no reason to follow this path, but there's also no reason that you um, can't. Uh, the rule is just that you have to you know, make sure that the number of steps you're moving to the right equals the number of steps that you come back to the left. Um, and same thing with the up and down directions. Um, the biggest thing here is that if you're a little unclear on where the dislocation is actually located in the lattice, just make sure your, your loop is big enough that you've definitely gone around it. So for example, if I had no idea where this dislocation was in the volume, um, I could have my burgers um, circuit be all the way around this outside edge. Um, and I, and that, would, that would guarantee <laughs> that if there's a dislocation there, I would be going around it. Um, so that's, uh, that's just a trick to keep in mind. Um, so again, coming back to this basic Volterra's construction, um, uh, once I've made my slice and I've created this, uh, uh, this slice into the perfect lattice, um, I can move the top of this slice relative to the bottom in, in three potential different translation directions. Um, and they're illustrated by these arrows here. So in the top case, um, the top part is being translated sort of back into the right with respect to the bottom part. Um, in the middle case, uh, the top slab is being translated vertically upwards with respect to the bottom. And in the bottom case, the top slab is being translated essentially to the left with respect to the bottom. Um, and in each of these cases, again, we have um, some figures here which are tracking what's happening to atomic planes. Um, they result in different kind of uh, Burgers vectors um, and different, uh, sorry, different orientations of Burgers vectors. Um, and these are associated with different kinds of dislocations. And so in this top case, um, we, if we, again, if we have our loop around the dislocation like this, then this is an edge dislocation. So our extra half plane of atoms is this green line right here. Um, and on the picture, that's equating to this extra half plane of atoms. Um, if I look at the, uh, the case one step down, this is also an edge dislocation, um, but it's just oriented differently. So again, I'm going to end up with an extra half plane of atoms um, that sort of is, is this half plane here. Um, and so on my picture to the left, uh, that's this plane of atoms here, but it's still an edge dislocation. And the reason that is, is in both of these cases, that Burgers vector is perpendicular to the direction of uh, the dislocation. So the, the direction of the dislocation is this blue arrow. In both of these cases, the Burgers vector is perpendicular to the dislocation. And that's not the case in this bottom one. 
So when I have a burgers vector that is parallel to the dislocation, that results in a screw dislocation. Uh, we're going to get to that in a second, getting ahead of myself. Um, so before we go further, properties of an edge dislocation, um, remember it's a line. Um, and so I can have this little T symbol where the, the bottom part of the T is pointing towards the, other, the extra half a plane. But remember, the dislocation itself is a line that either um, goes into the board or comes out of the board, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, just as I've shown here. Um, how does the lattice deform around the dislocation? Um, so I'm, you know, you can think about it in terms of, again, squeezing in an extra half a plane of atoms here. And so that means that parts of the lattice are going to be under compression, parts are under tension, and parts are under shear. Um, and so not surprisingly, you know, the, the way to identify where these regions are is basically to look at bond lengths. And, you know, we can, we can focus on a cube kind of out here on the corner as our undistorted cube. And then ask how do bond lengths um, in different regions compare to that length? And so, um, you know, this horizontal bond length in this region gets compressed. Um, and that makes sense because, again, we're, uh, we're inserting an extra half plane of atoms. So um, the part of the edge dislocation near that extra half plane is under compression. Um, the part that is, you know, alternatively missing half a plane, you could view that as being under tension. And so basically uh, these, this plane of atoms is being pulled apart from this plane. Uh, and so that region is under tension. Uh, and finally, shear, if I look at, you know, um, something to the left or something to the right of that edge dislocation, in both of these cases, that cube has been sheared. It's sort of like I take that starting cube um, and I've sheared the top relative to the bottom. Picture a deck of cards that you're trying to push sideways. That's the picture for shear. Um, similarly, on this side, um, there's, there's some shear in the lattice, but in uh, opposite direction. Um, so you basically end up with um, maxima and shear on either side of the edge dislocation. So different parts of the lattice around the edge dislocation um, uh, exhibit different kinds of deformation. Uh, and finally, the Burgers vector, again, if you go through the process um, of creating um, a Burgers circuit, uh, and so we can do that. We can define a vector. In this case, I'll have it going into the board. Um, so let's say I define this as my start. Um, uh, because the vector is going into the board, uh, my right-hand rule is telling me I should go uh, clockwise this way. So let's go one, two, three, four. Uh, and then let's go down one, two, three, four steps. And then I would go to the left, one, two, three, four, and up, one, two, three, four. And so this is my finish. Uh, and if I'm using right hand uh, start to finish notation, then the burgers vector in this case is going to be pointing uh, this way, and it's one unit set long. So even though I've shown the burgers vector down here, um, you know, the vector itself is the same magnitude and direction. It doesn't really matter where I illustrate it uh, on this uh, image. So that's edge dislocations. Screw dislocations, again, this would be the final case, and that's where the displacement of one half uh, of this slab is parallel to the direction of the dislocation itself. Um, a screw dislocation... Um, is uh, associated with lattice deformation as well, it turns out that screw dislocations are pure shear. So there's no regions of tension, there's no regions of compression. Um, but you can kind of see how, again, um, this, this top part is sort of being sheared to the back with respect to the bottom part. And so that's, um, that's where uh, the shear is. Um, and I'm, I'm going to show something, hopefully they'll make this clear um, later, but uh, the shear is not localized just on this particular plane. Shear is actually distributed uniformly um, radially away from the dislocation. Um, and it happens, um, you know, uh, down here just as much as it's showing up here. 
This just happens to be the plane that I've illustrated that step along. Um, so screw dislocations are pure shear. Um, the Berger's vector, um, again, I've kind of, here, let me change my uh, ink color so we can make this clear. Um, if I do the same process as before, um, and I, so I'm uh, again going to play the right hand uh, or apply the right hand start to finish convention. Um, so let's give this uh, dislocation a direction. Let's say it's going into the board. Um, if I have a, uh, my thumb, so it's pointing in that direction, uh, and I say this is my start, then I'm going to be going down first, and I'm going to be moving around clockwise. Um, and so, you know, maybe it's not exactly clear where this dislocation is, so let's go all the way around the edge of this block. So I'm going to go down one, two, three, four, five steps. I'm going to go to the left uh, a whole bunch of steps. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine steps. I'm going to go up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine steps. I'm going to go back to the right nine steps. That should bring me back to this corner. And then I'm going to go down four steps. And so my start was over here. My finish is over here. And again, I'm applying right hand start to finish. So my burgers vector is one uh, uh, unit set one uh, unit cell edge length long, um, and it's pointing again parallel to the dislocation and in the same direction as the dislocation in this case. Um, so so that's how I look at the burgers vector uh, for a screw dislocation. Um, now, I mentioned uh, that I was going to show this before. So whenever you see pictures of screw dislocations, they always kind of look like this. Um, so you, you have your dislocation sticking out. There's this, uh, you know, this plane that we sort of see starting to poke out. And it's very tempting to think that there's something very special and exciting uh, on this plane because it's kind of easy to see shear. You know, I see that this top part is moving to the right and the the... The back part is moving to the left. And so it's kind of easy to see the shear along that plane and, and less easy to see it along some other plane. So, for example, along a plane here. Um, but you can visualize it on other surfaces. And what you have to do is picture peeling back an individual layer of, of atoms or an individual um, you know, layer of unit cells, ultimately. Um, and so that's what I've tried to do here. So this is our starting point. Um, and it should look exactly like the picture that we have down here. Um, and all of these blue dots are uh, corners of lattice uh, of, of unit cells that we're going to basically remove one by one. And so as we come down here, we're starting to peel those unit cells away. Um, so we've removed some of them here. This guy's gone. Um, we've re removed a couple more until we get to uh, this case down here. So this bottom picture, I've removed all of those unit cells that have the blue um, corner. So I haven't, I haven't done anything to the lattice. I've just chosen to draw it differently. Um, and you see the, the result is that now that sort of super special plane is oriented differently. And again, now I could kind of visualize the shear here because I see that this top part is moved to the back with respect to the bottom part, which is moved forwards. Um, and that's different from initially, I can see on this top plane, you know, the right part is moved to the back and the back part is moved forwards. And so what this series of images is trying to show is that there's nothing special at all about this exposed, uh, this exposed plane um, that's associated with the screw dislocation. Um, the shear is actually uh, on any particular plane that I choose to uh, look at. So shear is uniform radially around the, dis the screw dislocation. So nothing special about that particular plane because I could have cho chosen to draw it differently. Um, so finally, uh, you know, um, dislocations, uh, the Berger's vector is conserved but the uh, direction of the dislocation line itself could be bent. And so in this case, you know, if this vector is pointing along the direction of the dislocation, it starts off here, but then it, it, it sort of bends in our material, and that's totally okay. 
and now the direction is kind of coming out of the plane this way. Um, while that's the case, the Burgers vector, so if I look at this surface, I see a screw dislocation, and if I were to um, you know, uh, determine my Burgers vector, it would be pointing uh, along the slip in this direction. Um, and over here on the right-hand face, I see an edge dislocation, but that Burgers vector is pointing in the same exact direction, and it's the same magnitude. So for a particular dislocation, the Burgers vector is constant all the way along that dislocation line. The Burgers vector cannot change unless that dislocation um, has interacted with other dislocations or with the edge of the crystal. Um, and so, you know, dislocations, uh, they were sort of a, uh, a concept um, that was applied to um, describe why materials weren't as strong as we thought that they should be. Um, but it turns out there's a lot of evidence for dislocations. If you take single crystals and you pull them in tension, uh, you don't tend to see uniform uh, plastic strain. Instead, you see these sort of step-like features. And this is because um, dislocations are slipping along particular crystallographic surfaces. And you know what? We see that same thing if we look really, really close um, at the nano scale at crystalline materials as well. So these are uh, lattice planes that are tens to maybe hundreds of atoms long. Uh, and as we pull this thing, again, this is being pulled in tension, um, then we see slip along those planes. <coughs> and ultimately, um, the material will uh, fail and the slip will detach. Um, you can also see evidence for them in terms of uh, uh, TEM images, which are sensitive to sort of localized strain. Um, and so dislocations are these linear features that if you deform the material or if you heat it up, you can actually watch the dislocations move around in a transmission electron microscope. Um, so that's all I'm going to say for about dislocations. I will say that there is a great resource out there with a lot of additional information. Um, I drew from here for a lot of the images that I showed, particularly earlier on um, in the video. Um, but uh, if you want to learn more, uh, this is probably the first place I would point you. Uh, all right. Thank you.